Welcome to School of the Wilds. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with Cleveland Metro Parks. Thank you for choosing nature. I am naturalist Marty Calabrese, a naturalist with Cleveland Metro Parks. Welcome to School of the Wilds, the first installment of School of the Wilds. Over the next several weeks through February, we are going to take you from invertebrates through some trees, uh, amphibians, reptiles, uh, birds and mammals, and maybe some wildflowers along the way. We're going to give you a wildlife primer through winter, so you are feeling ready to go and be your own naturalist this spring. I'm speaking to curious minds, young and old out there. And who is we when I say we are going to take you through this? It's myself, Marty Calabrese. It is Selby Majewski Bean and Jeff Reby. Those are two other naturalists with Cleveland, Cleveland Metro Parks, and they uh, they work out of North Chagrin Nature Center. Perhaps some of you out there. Whoops, it says you cannot hear me. Hey, oh, I can't hear you. Whoops, goodness. Thank you. <clears throat> How that? You can hear me now, right? I was keeping the mic off there for a few minutes while we were getting started. Give me some feet. Sound has been good for me. So you have been hearing me. Okay. Well, what's I can hear you, but it would be nice if you could make it louder. If not, it's fine. You can hear me okay? You heard me the whole time? Okay. All right. Weird. All right. Let's continue. So... Moving forward, yeah, this is the first installment, the first presentation, and we have a, a whole lineup for you through January and February. Let's move it right along here. Some of the wildlife on the screen. I've, I've seen some good guesses here. Yeah, and this is the Eastern Milk Snake. It has a distribution on the, it was sort of the Midwest and right over Ohio. And feel free to share your location if you'd like, your city and state. This is a Canada lily. That's also an Eastern species, but up into Canada as well. And this huge gull, I heard somebody, a guest out there, gull. This is the great black-backed gull, the largest, in fact. And it shows up as sort of late fall in the Cleveland area and sticks around through winter. And this is our Ohio buckeye. That is a difficult photo for you to use if you are using it to identify uh, moving forward, so what do you see here? Tonight we're going to talk about all sorts of wildlife. Take a look at this photo, and I don't mean, you know, what species you're seeing, or maybe I do. I just get a sense for you. Stare at this, and what's going through your head? You, you know, young or grown, do you see more yellow flowers? Did you notice the fuzzy white ones in the background? Did you notice this little white one down here? So... A naturalist might look at this a little different, or a biologist, you know, we might look at this and we, I see this part of the stem here and I, I think, oh, those aren't quite blooming yet. And I get a sense for what time of year it is. Oh, and, and thanks, Holly Rose, for putting in, you're actually writing what species you see. Yeah, you see some coneflowers, the actress, black-eyed Susan. Uh, I don't see the black-eyed Susan. They could be out there. I do see those sunflowers, though. But the point I'm sort of making here is that I'd, I'd like to point out naturalists at Cleveland Metro Parks and throughout other park districts, what we, when you take a walk with a naturalist, we like to figure out what species we're looking at, okay? And let's say there was, let's say those sunflowers there, you know, a whole group of sunflowers, that would be a population of sunflowers. But let's say you have a population of sunflowers plus a, a population of that, of those, of the liatris, as you called it, a different wildflower on that previous screen, those two populations together, and maybe throw in a population of, of gray squirrels. So all together, that's a community. So you see the progression here from species to population to community, and then those community, uh, multiple communities, in, you know, in combination and in, in concert with each other, that's an ecosystem and these are the biological levels of organizations and I personally focus a lot on the species level. I really like to take a look at that. I like to find new species, photograph new species 
And that's what I'm sharing with you this evening. So photographs and video. And it's not just one of those topics that I mentioned earlier, like mammals or birds or, or butterflies. I, I'm going to share quite a bit with you. This is the this is the intro to School of the Wild. So in subsequent weeks, we're going to focus on one group at a time. So why do I care? Why do you care? So maybe you think that squirrel right there, that fox squirrel, is quite cute. And so then you'd say, oh, yeah, the, it's valuable for its own sake. It's intrinsically valuable. You, I don't think you want to cuddle up with the squirrel, but maybe you're looking at it and you're saying, oh, Oh, I like that squirrel. But you know what? Wildlife is also important for these instrumental reasons, economic reasons. I'm thinking medicine, for example, and ecosystem services like maybe wildlife. And this would be plants and trees as well. If it if you have quite a bit. Uh, thank you for throwing in some some uh, suggestions there, Chris. And I see that some of you are chatting privately with me and, and that's okay too. Remember, you can also share your answers with the whole group as we move forward. Uh, ecosystem services, let's say it rains real hard. You want those trees to slow down the water before it gets to the wetland and you want the wetland to suck up the water quickly and hold on to it and release it slowly. That's an ecosystem service. You know, it's, it's provided to humans and it's hard to certainly quantify how valuable that is, by the way. I'm loving some of these comments and they're just flying in at me. And thank you. Oh, and Shashard in Ohio. Yeah, remember you can share your location. I know we have some folks from across the United States and possibly outside of the United States. So how am I going to share some of this wildlife with you? How have I sorted it? Well, I picked sort of a non-scientific way. We're going to go by size. We're going to start with the big and we're going to go through it and end up with the small. So starting with the large, what's bigger than trees? So you've got your huge uh, sycamores. What, that's actually just by diameter alone, you know, the whole size right through the tree. That's just one of the biggest around, okay? And then you've got your red oaks. And did you know when you see that cotton-like fuzz? on the streets and in the woods in the summer. That's from the eastern cottonwood. Okay, and then you have your smaller trees. Look at this pretty bark from a paper birch and the eastern red bud and the flowering dogwood. And those aren't quite flowers. But yeah, so getting a sense for the variety of trees. We have 650 in North America and 77 of those represented in Cleveland Metro Parks. And that's a big chunk of what actually is recorded in Ohio. I'm talking native tree species. The very first naturalist for Cleveland Metro Parks through the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, this gentleman here, Arthur B. Williams, is wrapping this tree. He's trying to get a sense of the diameter right through the middle of the tree. He, he wraps the tree around, learns its circumference, does some math, and learns the diameter right through the middle. and tries to get a sense of how old this Eastern Cottonwood is because at this time in 1946, Arthur B. Williams, A.B. Williams was leading a survey team to select 150 trees that would have been here when Cleveland was not yet buildings like this, but when Cleveland was established and founded in, in 1796. So here we are, 19, now I don't know if this photo is from 1946, but he, selected these 150 trees in 1946. That is 150 years after Cleveland was founded, and they are called Moses Cleveland trees. 150, but there are, they were not all in Cleveland Metro Parks. There's a handful in Cleveland Metro Parks that actually still stand, though, and I have been to a few of them. We're talking trees that near 300 years old. Very impressive. Take a breather. Here's your downward deer. Then, uh, you know, remember we're going from large to small. White-tailed deer, this is a big animal, our second largest mammal that uh, could and would be in Cleveland Metro Parks. And we have, take a look at the antlers here on this male. And take a look at the antlers here, also on the male. What do you notice that's different? These here on your left, those are fresh antlers. And over on your right, this is the summer rack. So 
It, it, they've scraped off what we call velvet. That's, it's kind of this fleshy tissue. It's vascular. There's some blood that can go through it. Yes, Tony, Anthony, velvet. Yeah, so we've got um, worldwide anywhere between 5,488 to 6,000 to 6,400, depending on your source. That's how many mammals there are, and 400 in North America, and 44 in Cleveland Metro Parks. Oh, and some of them are just too hard to find. So we have uh, some research going on, students at nearby universities that take a look at the footage from the footage from these wildlife cams. And it's a camera strapped to a tree and it's triggered by movement. It takes a short video, takes a few photos. There's your white-tailed deer at night via infrared. Our third largest mammal in Ohio, the American beaver. So this is an herbivore, it's a rodent. It's the largest rodent in North America. Sometimes when you see this, you might think it's a muskrat, but take a look at the difference between the tail, as I circle it here with the pointer, the tail, this flat, broad, naked tail on the beaver, compare it to this very thin muskrat tail. Now, this is a nocturnal animal, but I tell you what, every time I see it, it's during the day. So, yeah, they come out during the day. Streams, ponds, lakes, uh, 20 teeth on this herbivore. So not a ton, but they do have a lot of cheek teeth that helps them chew up the, the wood that they eat. And as, as they eat that wood, a tree falls over, and then they drag pieces from that tree back to their den if they're creating a lodge, and they smush it all together with with mud. Let's take a look at one here. Now this is taking a swim right near Rocky River Nature Center, one of our nature centers on the west side of Cleveland. Again, this is the beaver. As, as you see it swim, you'll see the nose, eyes, ears, but you don't see much else. It's able to navigate and just keep those sort of vital pieces of its body right out of the water so we can see what's going on. Look at that. Look at this wide, flat tail back there. Oh, yeah. And again, this is right behind Rocky River Nature Center. And you can see, you can see an animal like this. You just don't, you're not normally ready for it when you see it. And you just need to rule out muskrat. Beaver is quite a bit larger and it has that wider tail. We're going to move forward here in a second. Oh, we're getting a good look at it. I wonder if it's holding a little bit of food and I never noticed. I think it is. Sometimes they slap their tail against the water when they notice you, but this beaver did not mind me. I think it knew I was a naturalist, so it didn't mind at all. There it goes. Now here's your quiz. Is this a beaver or a muskrat? And because I know that that is tricky business from, from this angle, I'm gonna give you a little clue here in three, two, one. Okay. What do you think now? We've got one guess for muskrat, another for muskrat. Take a look at that tail, wide tail on the beaver. Narrow tail on the muskrat. Good job to those of you who guessed muskrat. I think everybody got it right. All right, the numerous. So we have, I should say, the world has tons of bats, upwards of 1,400 bat species. This is a large percentage of that 6,000 mammal number. So we're talking 20% of mammals are bats. 47 bats in North America and uh, nine for Ohio. Kind of hard to find, but they're around. This is a, a little brown bat. Look at this lighter belly, this lighter ventral area. Look at the membrane, the skin between its, its uh, that makes up its wing there. And see how it's nice and dark? Again, little brown bat. Now these are big brown bat. Can you, can you count how many adult females there are in this maternity colony? Now this is right underneath right underneath a nice little hiding spot at Rocky River Nature Center. 
And they, oh, that was a quick count. Eight. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, I think there might be eight in there and not more. Yeah, what they do is they, they like to hide from the heat. This particular species, big brown bat. And so during the day, they're going to hide from the heat. They're going to go underneath a, the eve of, of your home and hide out there. And then they're going to head back out at night and they're going to do their hunting for flying insects like mosquitoes, for example. The finned fishes, of course, plenty of fish through Cleveland Metro Parks. We are connected to Lake Erie and we have a lakefront reservation which has lots of acreage right along natural shoreline of Lake Erie. Now there's 22,000 fish species worldwide. This right here on the left is a rainbow trout steelhead and this here on the right is a, a small animal, a small fish called a darter, okay? And this rainbow trout and steelhead, same species. So if the, if the rainbow trout, so in our case, if it, if it leaves a larger body of water like Lake Erie and the fishermen and women are catching with fly, if they're fly fishing and trying to catch this animal uh, in our rivers like the Chagrin River and the, the Rocky River, that's when you call it a steelhead. It loses some of its color. It's a little more streamlined. This darter, take a look as it moves here. Um, well, at least take a look at how it's sort of postured. It, it holds its fins there and it sort of can walk with them. It's pretty neat. This is another rainbow darter. And it's, a, you know, if, you, if I scoot back here and take a look at this, you can tell that it's a male by looking at all these blue lines there, about 10 of them. So this is one of those fish you can tell male to female. All right, these reptiles, some, some people's favorite, the turtle, the shelled. Now this snapping turtle is huge. It is the largest reptile in Ohio by weight. And I'm telling you that this is a painted turtle. I've written it there, but can anybody guess what species that is? So take a look at it. Take a look at that, uh, the color, the, the red color by its ear, and that might give, give you a little bit of guess. There's 8,250 reptiles into the world, 300, 360 turtles in the world, 56 in North America, and nine in Cleveland Metro Parks. Yes, if you count, if you count that red-eared slider right there, that's what I was pointing, that's what I was pointing to. So these sliders could show up and they're a non-native species. Unfortunately, sometimes folks release their pets into the waterways. And this little red-eared slider will grow larger than this painted turtle and begin to outcompete it for um, habitat, for its food, space, for nesting. The legless snakes. This was that snake from the cover slide there the eastern milk snake. I did not point out this characteristic feature here, this field trait that can help you identify it. I'm circling what could be described as the letter Y right on the back of his neck, okay? And I don't know if that's a male or female. And then the northern ringneck, really take a look, easy to identify. And these are small. So that ringneck snake is a relatively small snake. The milk snake, this one is young. It will get larger, it's very vibrant in color when it is young, and both of these just turned up, you know, you know, right outside of the nature center, right underneath, uh, let's see, this ring neck was right underneath the, the shed, and I think this milk snake was also nearby, not on the same day. Beautiful, beautiful snakes. 154 snake species in North America, 11, by the way, in Cleveland Metro Parks, 3,600 worldwide. Birds, there is a huge bird energy in Cleveland. I led a bird walk this morning. We were able to find and hear 15 species, two different hawk species, a red-tailed hawk and a cooper's hawk. And thank you for joining, folks. I know some of you out there were on that very bird walk this morning. White-breasted nuthatch on the left. This is the bird that sort of goes hark, hark, hark. And that was a, we'll take another look at this black-capped chickadee there. What happens here is so many people have fed these birds over time, hand fed these birds, black oiled sunflower seed, that all I did was stick my hand out and that bird 
was a little angry I did not have any seed for it. Okay, so 10,000 bird species worldwide. And the latest count in our county, right here in Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, was 347 bird species. Again, a huge energy for following and finding birds, rare birds, documenting them right here in Cleveland. The talent. So when we're talking about birds, there's also birds of prey, birds that might even eat other birds. And we've got this barred owl. Take a look at its head. Look at this. I'm showing you the back of this barred owl, but it's facing us. It has double the neck bones, the cervical vertebrae that you and I do. Let's see, 14. So it, it really allows that animal to rotate its head more than this 180 degrees. It can go this and another half. So well, let's 270 degrees. And that's a good thing. Its eyesight is so good. Its eyes are so big. It does not have much space for muscles. That's in the eyes. So it can't push those eyes around from left to right. So it's, it really is a cool adaptation that it can move its head around from left to right. Did you notice the bald eagle there? There's a bald eagle nest, and you can check out the live stream of this nest. Just go to clevelandmetroparks.com and plug, plug in, type in eagle nest or eagle cam into the chat. I'm sorry, into the, into the search feature, and it, it'll be one of your first links that pops up. We have a camera right on that, and you can tell when there's some activity. I've been watching these eagles since 2013. There's been some unfortunate nests, like the nest falling down due to weather, but they're usually pretty successful, anywhere between one and three eggs. And it takes a long time to get, to get the nest going. You know, they're maintenance in the nest. They may have already started. Some nests around Cleveland have. There's been some nesting pairs that have already gotten back together and started to maintenance those nests. And then after those eggs are laid, there's at least a month of incubation on those eggs. And then another two months that they are raising those young in the nests. And this whole time, did you notice the nest back here? This is the nest in Rocky River Reservation. Hard to find? I guess, che again, check in on that nest cam live feed if you want to take a look and, and see if there's any activity. Ooh, what species are we looking at here? Who is this? So this is the great horned owl. And this is also a nest in Rocky River Reservation, and it's not active every year. And she was able to raise a few young this year in a sycamore. All right, moving forward, the amphibious. We have frogs and toads. Does anybody know how to tell that that's a green frog right there? Oh, I love your, your chat, your, your comments coming in. And remember, you can send those to the whole to the whole group. I might actually minimize that just for a moment. I need a little bit of space on the screen. No, I'll leave it on there. I like seeing them come in. All right, green frog, you can tell because it has these folds right along the back. There you go. And I, I've seen some of your questions come in and let me just say, I will try to address those at the end. How about that? I'll sort of scroll through and see if there's any questions for the good of the group. American toad, we have one to three warts within each dark black spot there. 3,500 frogs and toads worldwide, by the way. 100 in North America and nine or 10 in Cleveland Metro Parks. This is another look at that green frog. I want you to see these dorsolateral ridges, these folds right down the back here. So we have the eye, the eardrum. And then that fold that goes the whole way back. That is not the case with a bullfrog or the toad that we saw. And there it goes. More amphibious animals, perhaps my favorite, salamanders. We have the two-lined salamander on the left. You can sort of make out those two lines going down the back. These hang out stream side. They love water. They need water to reproduce. Now, so does this animal, our state amphibian, the state amphibian, of Ohio, the spotted salamander. And it has these spots as sort of warning that coloration. It wants to remind animals that dare take a bite, that it does not taste good, and that distasteful um, 
you know, taste is, is not soon forgotten based on how it looks. So some animals like to blend in, some animals like to stick out in this way so they can be remembered. Can you think of another animal? I'm thinking of a mammal, it's black and white, that has a really easy to see coloration. Salamanders, 342 in the world, 187 in North America, 15 in Cleveland Metro Parks. That's right, more species of salamander than frogs and toads. This is a young redback salamander. They do not always have the red back. Yeah, skunk, the striped skunk. That's exactly what I was thinking of, folks. Thank you for those answers there. These redback salamanders, they do like to hang out underneath logs. They need a, a cool but damp environment. They do not have lungs, this particular salamander. So it uses cutaneous respiration. It's got to breathe right through the skin. And for that to work, its skin needs to remain wet and moist. All right, invertebrates. Invertebrates is a huge group. So there's about 1.3 to 1.5 million animal species known on planet Earth right now. 90% of them are invertebrates. 90% of all the animal species. And you know what? A million species are insects, and that's where these dragonflies and damselflies fall. Can you see why this is called a common whitetail? Oh yeah, and that's the male right there. And this is a damselfly. Take a look, it has this narrow abdomen, so head, thorax, abdomen, and we'll take another look at that in a moment. And it looks like a female here because she has the beauty dots, and the abdomen is lacking the, the metallic blue color. So take a look for dragonflies and damselflies in Cleveland Metro Parks. There's 50 different dragonfly species, can you believe it? And 31 damselfly species. And can you believe these animals? When you take a closer look, they are just great hunters. They're predators. Look at these lights for grasping prey. Here's a nice female widow skimmer. She's right there sitting on my fingers because she just emerged through her stage, one of her stages of metamorphosis. And at this point, they're very docile and they just relax. And she was stuck to one of the windows on Rocky River Nature Center. And I just sort of set her free and she relaxed for a moment. And here's another one of those young stage dragonflies. You call the tenoral stage right after they emerge. From their nymphal skeleton, this is the common green darner, the world's fastest insect. 6,000 species of dragonflies and damselflies worldwide. Okay, we've got perfect insect here, head, thorax, abdomen, six legs. So three pairs of legs and these huge compound eyes. And this was right here as I was walking by on this American beach. And I was very gentle. I couldn't resist to take a closer look. And of course I set it free. Moving forward, Let's talk about some plants and then we'll finish up. Thank you for sticking with me. Poison ivy, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, we've got that. It's compound leaf. Three leaflets, leaves of three, let it be. And then it's look-alike, some people think. Okay, a look-alike here. Also a compound leaf, but it has five leaflets. That's what I want you to notice. What do you think we're looking at here? Poison ivy or Virginia creeper? I'll give you about five seconds. Are we looking at poison ivy or Virginia creeper? And I will say this is one individual, it's one plant, it's one individual plant. Both, you know, uh, thank you for the suggestion, Sabrina and Aiden says Virginia creeper, yeah. You know, when I walked by, I thought it was poison ivy. Took another look here. It is Virginia creeper because of that compound leaf of five leaflets. It tricked me on the first pass. Our state wildflower, the great white trillium. And another spring wildflower here, wild blue phlox. Lots of wildflowers, lots of energy surrounding wildflowers as well, including metro parks. You can tag along on a hike with a naturalist through spring as the wildflowers go into bloom. It's a great time. I like to document those as well as birds. And even into the fall, Though the flowers get a little tricky. Now these are comp 
These are compound flowers. These are in the Asteraceae family, a huge family worldwide, 32,000 species. And take a look at that one too. So it's the sunflowers, the daisies, the asters, again, compound flowers. So you have all these rays and the disc here, with many, many flowers for every head. So that's many, many flowers right there. It's not like the spring wildflowers where we were just looking at by comparison, these are petals. And that's one flower. All right. And who likes flowers? Pollinators. What's this? What kind of pollinator is this? What are we looking at? Tell me what you think. It's visiting bee balm or, or wild bergamot specifically. It's sticking its proboscis in there. Great guess, Sabrina. Thank you. It is a moth. We do have a moth here, not a hummingbird. And this was visiting the, the summer wildflower garden right out front of Rocky River Nature Center. You take a look at these wildflower gardens. There are all sorts of, the pollinator diversity is through the birth, through the, through the roof. Yes, hummingbird moth. Thank you, Hillary. Or one of them, one of them. There's multiple species. Yeah, so the butterfly weed here, taking another, taking a closer look here at another spring wildflower, another, uh, sorry, summer wildflower in that case, and into fall. Visiting those flowers, not just the moth, but, but butterflies. And next week's presentation from Selby Majewski Bean is butterflies. Take a look at these butterflies. Pick your favorite. Boom! Look at this diversity, these colors. I want you to right away see if you can find the monarch and see if you can find the viceroy. So maybe you were looking at one and thought it was the other. This here is the viceroy. And this is the monarch. Whoops, there you go. That's about as far as my laser pointer goes. This is the monarch. Yes, left-hand side for the viceroy. I want you to notice this black band here that encircles the body, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. This, this black band there that cuts right through the wings. That helps you figure out it's a viceroy. It's a smaller animal too, uh, but it, um, if you're just looking at a photo or maybe you just see one and you don't have the two side by side, that feature is very helpful. Lots and lots of butterflies through Cleveland Metro Parks. As you move through, as you move through any of our trails and visit any of our nature centers, especially in summer, 17.5 thousand butterflies worldwide, 717 in North America, 78 in Cleveland Metro Parks. Oh, and one of the most spectacular phenomena you will ever see near Cleveland is this migration of monarchs as in the fall, as I witnessed here on one September day, they move en masse from Canada, jump over Lake Erie and fly their little bodies all the way down to Mexico. And they need a break after they fly over Lake Erie. And that's exactly what I took a look at here and recorded on the, the poplars and cottonwoods at Wendy Park. And they're this is one morning and they're waking up after a few days of of piling more and more from Canada and the weather was good enough that they were getting ready to take off and head down to Mexico. Again, from Canada, amazing migration that these monarchs do. And there's a monarch right there as it just emerged, looks like right here, from its chrysalis. And there's another one developing right in there as it goes through metamorphosis. Spiders in Cleveland Metro Parks, oh yes. And there are 48,200 worldwide 642 624 in ohio spider diversity is is high it's through the roof lots of them don't even have common names did you notice this little one here so this is a nursery web spider and the female the mom she makes a little web here a little nursery for the spiderlings and we're just about through we are moving to the smallest of the small after beginning with the huge wildlife like trees the white-tailed deer and beaver, the microscopic, we have moss mites on the left. And the, these can be in 
huge numbers. So I'm talking 950 by my count one time. This I was doing scientific research on the matter. I wasn't sitting there in the woods counting one, one mite at a time. And they are in the leaf litter, so they're in the collection of leaves on the forest floor. And those are the moss mites, upwards of a thousand per square meter. That's a very small area. And then about half as many, so 500 per square meter, I counted on average of these springtails. This is an insect like creature, also on the forest floor, part of the soil arthropod community. They help break down. The, the, the leaf litter and the debris on the forest floor, including trees. And lastly, the hidden wildlife you might not even see, but is underneath your feet, like this Lumbricus terrestris, that's the fancy scientific name for nightcrawler, and the Amenthus. This is a this is a worm that's causing some trouble and gobbling up lots of that leaf litter on the forest floor and taking away from some of that or that very needed organic matter. We are on through. I will take it now. I will try and scroll through a little bit at your, at your questions. And thank you so much. Where do these go during winter? Oh, sorry. It looks like some of these questions are respective to the slide that was showing. Yes, that rainbow darter looks amazing. Do, do you still had change? It's look throughout the year. Well, uh, rainbow trout, once they, and they like cold water as we hit Fall and they stick around through winter, when you then are calling them steelhead because they're in the streams, that's when you see the fly fishing going on. Yes, they do change a little bit of color and they actually lose, they lose that stripe of pink and red. Where do the dragonflies go in winter? We do have three at least that I can think of that migrate, but unfortunately the rest do die. So uh, it's, it's great that some of these animals are strong enough. Black saddlebags, a uh, common green darner, wandering glider. Some of these dragonflies, they're super strong and tough and they migrate just like birds. Now I'm scrolling back up, looking through some, some of your questions. Oh, this is great because I, I see lots of these questions. I, I was able to answer, I was an looks like I answered them without even reading your, your questions. I do want to point out that next week, the School of the Wilds is Flowers That Fly by Selby Majewski Bean. She is another naturalist with Cleveland Metro Parks, and the presentation is on butterflies. So same place, same time, but you must register. If you find my name in the uh, near the chat area, there's a, a little internet icon next to my name. You should be able to click that, click that, and it takes you right to her event. Uh, web page on clevelandmetroparks.com and you should you could be able, you could register right there right now whoops do i have the date wrong the date on the next program slide says saturday the 17th but saturday is the 16th my mistake thank you for pointing that out it is definitely saturday so if saturday is the 16th that is that is the date okay it is saturday the 16th these programs are all going to be on Saturdays at 7 p.m. Again, if you can find that link next to my name, it'll take you right there. Or go to clevelandmetroparks.com, scroll through the calendar on the home page, and go to next Saturday and scroll down to 7 p.m. Any final questions before we, we wrap up here? At this time of year, poison ivy is easily recognized by the hairy rope. Thank you, Richard, for that comment. Yes, it is. In the absence of leaves, look for a vine with very hairy tendrils climbing up a tree or a, or a fence post. That helps you figure out that it's poison ivy. Thank you for choosing Cleveland Metro Parks tonight, for choosing nature. You could have had anything on this screen. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me. Again, I'm naturalist Marty Calabrese. I will see you soon and maybe on a, maybe on a future program. All right. See you soon. Thanks, folks.